Welcome to another episode of Content Stack Live with our host Jeff Baher. We're excited to have Emma Furlong, Director of Product Marketing from Dynamic Yield, joining us today. Let's get personal. Today we're talking on how Composable makes personalized content easier. So let's dive in. Hi, Emma. Welcome to Content Stack Live. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So you're from Dynamic Yield, one of our partners. Uh, maybe we'll just start with what your role is at Dynamic Yield and what Dynamic Yield does. Yep, sounds great. So I am the Director of Product Marketing at Dynamic Yield. And Dynamic Yield is an all-in-one operating system to deliver personalized experiences that are synchronized and optimized across the entire technology stack. So everything from web personalization and recommendations to personalization in email and SMS and even offline personalization. Awesome. All right. So we got an export here. So the title, let's get personal, how a composable makes personalized content easier. So personalization, obviously not necessarily a new topic. In fact, it's quite a hot topic. We pick up almost any magazine or trade kind of thing today. Um, it's not entirely solved. Like it, there's still some things that are very hard about personalization. Maybe you can break that down a little bit. Like what does kind of personalization mean? And you hinted at it a little bit, but yeah, why is it so hard? Yeah, so I think there's really two components to personalization or doing personalization effectively. So the first is that we know that consumers are expecting personalized experiences everywhere they go. So a brand or an organization isn't necessarily competing with their peers in their industry. They're competing with the last best experience their customer had, even outside of their industry or domain. So many times organizations that are starting to do personalization can really struggle to meet that standard. And it's not always due to lack of technology. So there is a lot of really phenomenal personalization software out there. However, if you don't have the right methodology, team structure, um, and kind of personalization roadmap in place, it can be really difficult to do that at scale. So you can have the most amazing car, like the souped up Ferrari, but if you don't know how to drive it, you can't take it anywhere. So I think it's really important to combine the right technology with the right methodology to you know, deliver personalization at scale. And I'm happy to go into more detail there, but at a high level, I think that's one of the reasons why it can be challenging. You feel like that there's a significant amount of handholding kind of associated with that in terms of customers already sort of know how they want to do it, or that's part of the challenges. There's the tech part, there's the best practices of both of which they don't relate anything about. Yeah, I think it really depends on the organization. So organizations that are more mature in personalization, we're seeing they've actually created personalization centers of excellence. So they have a dedicated team whose sole focus is personalization. So this includes people that are building out the personalization roadmap, the testing roadmap, people that are defining content zones on the website, that they want to continually optimize and test. And then those people are really deeply integrated within the rest of the organization and the rest of the marketing team so that those teams can kind of speak together seamlessly and run personalization really at the center of the business instead of a layer on top. And the latter, I think, is where a less mature organization will try and bring personalization into the work scope of you know, non-personalization experts. And that's where more hand-holding is needed. And there are a lot of great resources out there, however, for brands that are a little bit less mature and you know need that help. Uh, so there's definitely resources available. We have some at Dynamic Yield that are completely agnostic, um, really designed to show you how to start thinking about building a personalization program. Again, completely agnostic of the technology vendor that you're using um, because it is complex. It is challenging. There's so much to it and there's so much capability. So we really like to kind of break it down and help a brand, whichever platform that they're using, that they'll still feel like they can deliver great experiences because ultimately the more people that are delivering great personalization, like the further the industry will come. And that's, you know, our dream state is that more brands will have those personalization centers of excellence so they can really make the most out of their personalization technology and not leave some of these features on the table. What's quite common is either you're walking into an environment that's quite mature, there is a personalization kind of center of excellence that you work with, or it's a big part of kind of the adoption and incubation of the technologies that you start to groom that within an organization so they... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a huge part of it is really, you know, the customer success managers at Dynamic Yield, at least, and I'm sure at many other personalization technology providers are really interested in helping build that 
team structure. A lot of our kind of customer keynotes that we do at different events are actually our customers talking about how they built a team structure to support personalization. And we've had instances where the A-B testing team, for example, is completely separate from the personalization team, which we really don't recommend because those two teams, you know, to really deliver effective personalization, those things are done in tandem. So what I mean by that is if you're A-B testing something on the website, um, you want to be able to institutionalize those learnings and then personalize accordingly. So if you're doing one without the other, doing the latter without the data from testing is kind of like taking shots in the dark, but doing the former without the personalization is getting all of these insights, but not really being able to action them. So we have a customer who actually, after using Dynamic Yield, combined those teams into one larger organization because they saw the benefit of combining those workflows together. Yeah. We'll get into this a little bit later when we get into some of the best practices or into some of the use cases, but maybe before we go too far, personalization, just quick definition. Let me touch on a little bit before um, yeah. and I'll, I'll put out. So it's, it's not just hi, Emma, and like, welcome to this page. So like, help us yeah. understand, like when you say personalization, because there's a little bit of like, A-B testing kind of feeds into that. There's like yep. segmentation, recommendation engines, but like what's... The gold standard of personalization would be that you, you know, the brand entity, um, let's say it's an airline, is serving the right content and messaging to the right person at the right time. And even beyond that is anticipating their needs and really serving them effectively so that the customer or the prospect or whoever it is that's visiting the site can do what they want to do faster and find what they want to do faster and feel like the experience is truly tailored to them. Now, in terms of use cases, there's thousands of permutations of forms that th that can take. Like you said, just putting someone's first name on a website, that's not really helping them feel like the experience is tailored to them or helping them achieve their goal faster. Um, but it is something you can do to make them feel seen. But it's certainly not what we would call the gold standard of that vision of every customer coming to an experience and feeling like they're understood, that their best interests are in mind, and that they can navigate through the experiences really seamlessly because it's the path is tailored for them for where they want to go. Okay. So it's obviously a lot of moving parts behind that. So let's maybe like shift gears, talk a little bit more yeah. about like dynamic yield. What's yeah. the kind of approach that dynamic yield takes to solve some of these pain points? And how does this kind of fit into the, the world of, you know, we obviously live in around composable architectures right. and. Well, I think, you know, to answer the latter part of that question first, um, personalization doesn't happen without a whole other host of technologies behind it, content stack being a key one of them, right? Having a content management system that, you know, you're actually serving this personalization on and with and through. You compose Dynamic Yield is part of the Mock Alliance. We're big champions of Composable. We consider ourselves a headless personalization um, solution because you know, we really believe in being able to piece together best of breed technologies across the entire marketing technology stack. So that's a key piece here. You know, we don't want our customers to feel that they have to use some list of systems to use Dynamic Yield effectively. So by taking a composable approach, our customers are really empowered to build the MarTech stack that is going to work best for them. And then also have the kind of integrations and the capabilities across these different technologies flow together really seamlessly, which is extremely important when you're talking about, you know, personalizing the site in real time, taking content from the CMS. Um, you know, that's crucial. So composable is a huge part of our, um, kind of philosophy right now and will be continue to be a big part of it moving forward. We often, you know, when we talk about people who implement content stack, oftentimes you say, if you look under the hood, no one implementation is really the same. Say the same when you're like, yeah, when I look at the stacks that our customers are building out to do personalization, obviously we'd like to know that you're in the stack and we're in the stack, but yeah. is it safe to say that they all can look very different. And I'm yeah. assuming you serve many different industries. So there's, then we'll get a little bit to that, too, but just. Yeah, no, there isn't a one size fits all. We're just solving for personalization. And that personalization doesn't just fit into the same stack every time either. There's a lot of customization. Exactly. It can be really varied. So for example, you know, because we're doing personalization across different channels, sometimes people will have a different e-commerce platform, CMS, CDP, ESP, right? These are all different and we need to connect with all of them. So yeah, just depending on the brand, the industry, it can be completely varied customer to customer, but thankfully with a composable approach, that doesn't really matter and that's fine. 
um, you know, we are continuing to optimize what our product, which we call Experience OS, um, to be like that single operating system for all things personalization and then connect out to whatever other platforms the brand needs to. That's great. I guess by virtue of being part of the mock alliance, there's a things kind of just work. Yeah. They all kind of share the same kind of common kind of glue and, and underlying technologies. And I think even even further, a lot of the brands that are big champions of Composable and Mock, you know, these are these are brands that are kind of ahead of the curve and really I think are pushing the industry forward. Um, but they have that same culture of, you know, building these types of, you know, a personalization center of excellence, these different programs. I think they're really innovative, really innovators. And so we find we have a lot of great success stories and are some of our um, biggest advocates and customer speakers are also using other components of the mock alliance because they're just kind of indoctrinated into this world of best of breed um martech innovation so for uh, your solutions have with dynamic you all many different industries that you serve and kind of within that which ones kind of maybe percolate to the top in terms of like the crawl walk run like yeah is anyone running yet with this or, or yeah. who's running and yeah I think the definition or the goalpost of running has changed. I think traditionally retail has always been kind of a forward looking industry for personalization. However, we do have some financial services and travel clients who are doing really incredible things. And interestingly, some industries, you know, retail is kind of considered as a gold standard, right? But interestingly, in some cases, like an airline, for example, or a bank is going to have more customer data and a higher likelihood of those customers actually logging in and authenticating. So ability to use now mm -hmm. that data. So in some cases, those industries are, while they may not be as mature in their personalization journeys, um, they actually are sitting on way more that they can do it and have in some ways an advantage. So for example, think about for an airline, all of the different ways you can personalize to someone if you already have the airline already has the data and the customer by the way is comfortable knowing that they have that data i love delta i'm a delta loyalist i log into my delta app all the time i know they have all my information and i'm completely fine with that so imagine how powerful it would be to personalize on top of that with complete transparency and trust with your customer base um, and being able to use all of that authenticated post login data as opposed to the majority of experiences in a retail environment, for example, where it's an unauthenticated or anonymous user. You know, gold standard here, I think there's really incredible, powerful things that kind of services industry, travel industry, um, in some cases, grocery as well, can do a lot easier than retail might be able to. Really kind of untapped that they're maybe not yet aware, like there is so much here because you have all this post authenticated data, you could do a lot more and they're just maybe not aware of it or yeah. Very yeah, I'm not sure how to action it. And I think the other thing that's really important there is, like I said, the consumer trust. So, you know, with a financial institution, you trust that they have your data and you know that they do. So you're going to be more trusting of an experience that's personalized to you versus maybe a retailer who you, you might not have consented to give that information. And that on the, kind of the flip side of that is a big trend we're seeing in retail right now is the personalizing to non-authenticated users when they say no to cookies and providing what we call self-segmentation experiences. So think about guided selling, product finders, quizzes, things where the customer is saying, I am telling you exactly what I like and exactly what I want, and I want you to personalize the site for me accordingly. It's a great way to get that active participation from the user without them needing to give up any data that they don't want to other than what they've expressly told the brand. So I think like on the flip side of this for retailers, that is very much a trend where the industry is going. There's a lot that can be done there. Um, again, like build a little bit more trust. Data privacy is also a hot topic right now. And so that's another great way to kind of be compliant, respect your customer's privacy and still have a great personalized experience for them. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, I mean, obviously a lot in that topic and just the whole, what kind of experiences do you create? But I think that's, we, we're seeing the same thing. We're obviously seeing this like non or cookie less kind of world. Like, and there's, you know, there's so much you can get out of that, but there's a lot more we think you can get just like you said, by having the user like opt into yes various types of quizzes, other types of like surveys, feedback, and using that to guide and then serve up additional content. 
you want to maybe do a little show and tell? Maybe let's uh, pick one or two examples out there that you want. Sure. To I'd be happy to. In personalization in general, it's really crucial to think about the customer journey. And the customer journey, depending on the industry, looks really different. Um, but we want to make sure that the brand is providing a consistent experience across it. So for travel, the way Dynamic Guild looks at the journey, and this can very much vary depending on who you're looking at. I'm going to give some airline examples. But we really look at this journey as browsing, booking, check-in, re-engagement, and then loyalty. And obviously, loyalty is really important in the travel space. So one of the things here, and this is browsing, so this is going to be pre-login, not using any of that great rich data that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's still things you can do for a completely unauthenticated user. So if you look at the bottom here, let's say you're booking a flight, you can simply recommend uh, destinations by popularity just to give that initial touch of things that they might be interested in. Um, however, if they've consented to cookies, you can also use customer affinity um, and also the season. So for example, if it's winter in New York, someone might be interested in going to a warm place. So, you know, location, um, the affinity. So based on the person's browsing behavior in session, actually recommending de destinations for them that they're likely to be interested in on top of the popularity. So that's just kind of one way with product recommendations to really, you know, from the first page view, kind of present a more tailored experience. And I can maybe do two more examples. Another great one is social proof. And this is another one where it's cookie-less in a sense because it's more about things that aren't related to that customer, but rather, you know, the brand's own data. So for example, if you see someone is looking at a page, you could have a pop-up that says this flight is selling out fast. It's had 95 views in the last week. So that's not talking about the customer's data, it's their own site data. We can look at someone's browsing behavior. And if it looks like they're maybe going to navigate away, you could have a pop-up that says something like, you know, you can cancel for free for eight hours after booking if you're unsure. And again, just like those urgency messages, 5% off if you book online now, there's a ton you can do with offers and social proof based on different triggers you can set with certain user behavior to get them to stay and complete that experience. And then the last one I would mention in terms of the post-login authenticated experience would be personalizing offers. So right now, a lot of airlines are partnering with Starbucks and Lyft and all sorts of different brands. Um, but those offers are kind of just being sent at random for better or for worse, similar with financial services. So with the post-login data, you'll have... Um, much more information around the customer's affinity to understand and actually personalize those offers. So if it's a business traveler, you might want to give them the ride sharing. They might be more likely to be ride sharing between business meetings, hotel, things like that. If it's a different kind of persona, a different kind of audience, the Starbucks offer might be more relevant. And there's a lot more tailoring you could do with the messaging itself. You can A-B test it, but this would be an example of kind of an in-app offers personalization that's much more tailored because the brand knows who that user is. And obviously, this is just one, one. Oh, this page. is one neat little it, example. It, yeah. So I can quickly see as you were saying that, I was thinking, like, oh, I see how you can need a center of excellence and how this can quickly I mean, just balloon based on all, you know, all the different, you know, web properties, pages, different paths with which users who can yeah. come in. Yeah. Wow. This is fascinating. Yeah. You really need a roadmap. And I think, you know, something else I wanted to quickly show was um, something we call our Rooted Personalization Hub, which is essentially designed to help with that. Like I said, regardless of which personalization technology you're using, because you can't boil the ocean. There's so many different things you can do. So we created this um, hub of educational content, again, completely agnostic, uh, with key resources of how to you know, put personalization into practice from just getting started through kind of maintaining and building a more sophisticated program. So we talk about how to build audiences, product recommendations, choosing evergreen zones on your digital properties to start building out tests, how to analyze the campaign performance and action those learnings. Um, so we're, you know, trying to make this knowledge as publicly available as possible to help any team, regardless of their personalization maturity, get started and instead of feeling overwhelmed by all the possibilities, feel empowered by them. I like it. I, need to, I would imagine you have quite a number of customers that take you up on that. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So um, 
Well, the next topic is on AI, unless you want to just close out on anything, but add one more hot topic onto another. What's kind of going on in that? Like, <laughs> obviously, that's probably a whole other episode in and of itself, but kind of curious what intersections you're seeing with AI personalization, maybe localization. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it definitely could be its own episode. We'll have you back. Sure. I would love to be back. Um, but yeah, we're doing a lot and we're seeing a lot in this space. So there's a couple of different categories where AI can be really effective in personalization. I'll start with the hottest topic, which is generative AI, your chat GPT. So with generative AI, something that Dynamic Yield is doing is we um, have something called Copyright ML. So we've actually implemented um, a generative AI tool in our product. So if you are looking to come up with different copy ideas for emails, A-B tests, things on the website, whatever it may be, and you're not quite sure or getting stumped on what you want the messaging to be, you can access that generative AI solution right within the tool, right where you're building that experience. So instead of like, okay, I want to come up with a different way to say 10% off these styles, it will generate options for you. And then you can upload them directly into that experience you're building. So that's one way. Very nice. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of other things. So, um, and a little going a little bit deeper as well. So, you know, we have like a deep learning, an entire deep learning system. So we have deep learning powered recommendations is one thing. And this is, you know, been live for dynamic yield for a long time, but we're constantly innovating on it. And this is a trend you'll see in the space as well. Um, but using deep learning to identify what product recommendations a customer might be most likely to, you know, be interested in or convert on. Um, but we also have AI powered affinity profiles. So this is actually looking at how can we use deep learning to better understand what this customer's affinity might be to recommendation or not. So deep learning on recommendations is more on the actual product level. Deep learning as it relates to affinity is more on the affinity level. So what I mean by that is, you know, let's say you purchased a um, microwave they, you might just get a bunch of additional recommendations for microwaves and it's a really frustrating user experience. The reason why that happens is you buy a microwave, your affinity profile without deep learning is gonna skyrocket for microwave. Um, but in a lot of industries, that's really not valuable. That might be valuable in fashion, but it's really unhelpful in, you know, consumer electronics. One time buys like that, yeah. One time buys, exactly. And this is just one example. Um, but so, and so with an AI powered affinity profile, what that would do is recognize the relationships between products, recognize how long someone would typically need before needing to buy such a product again, if ever. So instead of buying that microwave and getting a recommendation for a microwave, you might get a recommendation for another household supply or microwave cleaner or anything else that might be relevant. So that's another way that we're really trying to bring AI into every fundamental level of our product to enhance personalization without the marketer really needing to do as much. Wow. Very cool. Um, I'll just put a quick plug to, we have, um, for all of our episodes, we have a uh, release or episode notes. So everything you've mentioned in links and what you just showed, we'll make sure that our viewers get access to that as well. And anything else we want to like, we want to share, feel free. We can also add that as well, but the deep learning new capability existing that's been evolving or some, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot there in terms of, um, it's a combination of everything. So the deep learning recs and affinity are, are both things that have existed and things that were constantly evolving. The copyright ML generative AI ability is fairly new this year. And then we have a lot more really exciting stuff coming. I am not sure what I'm able to share just yet because there is some stuff that's maybe under embargo, but definitely the sneak peek that I can share is using AI to potentially conversational AI to make the shopping experience a lot more seamless. So that's all I can say. Very, very interesting. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll hold our breath until then. Yeah, very <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Very cool. So, uh, kind of sec live, it's kind of a live program. So we do get some questions as we're kind of going through when people are listening. So, um, I will turn it over to Austin. Austin, do you have a question or question one for Emma? Yeah, this one is. Uh, where can I go to learn more about implementing personalization best practices? Yeah. So as I showed earlier, it's the, the root of personalization hub would be a great place to start. So that would be dynamicyield.com slash rooted personalization. 
with a dash in between rooted and personalization would be a great place to start. Um, we also have something that we call the XP Squared Learning Center, um, which has basics of personalization. So the rooted personalization is more about how to implement. But if someone is just interested in what is A-B testing, what are different types of statistical engines, all of the kind of basic knowledge, you could also find there at, and that would be at dynamicguild.com slash learn. Nice. And I'm assuming we have a similar, like a technical services organization, like a center of excellence within our group that's, you know, helping people figure out how to go composable and stand up composable yeah. architectures. Probably a similar thing within Dynamic EO that customers have technical experts that they can work with or not only like go to these websites, read these documentations, but actual people too that can help us like stand these things up. Yeah. So every, every dynamic yield customer gets a customer success manager, a technical account manager, and an account director. The technical account manager is responsible for their implementation and then on any ongoing technical work. So if a customer is doing a replatforming, for example, the technical account manager could be brought back in to kind of support. And then of course we have a professional services organization for anything deeper that the customer might want to do. Yeah. Awesome. Good deal. Austin, you had another question. Yeah, we got one more and Emma kind of alluded to this earlier, but, you know, looking ahead into your crystal ball, you know, what else is on the horizon that has you really excited? Yeah, I mean, so there, there's a lot on the horizon. Like I mentioned, I think continuing to play with different AI interfaces to browse digital experiences, I think is a huge one that we're really, really excited about. Also in the AI trend, there's some really interesting stuff happening in kind of the visual AI space. So being able to kind of look at, you know, a product and then find similar ones that look like it is another trend that we're seeing and one that we're personally pretty excited about. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I think the more customers we see go composable, the better because they can continue to really refine their marketing technology stack and not be held back by having to kind of stick with one area or one type of product. A number of our customers are embracing a headless approach, but I think we're continuing to see more of them do so. So we're really doubling down on more bespoke and tighter integrations because we can integrate seamlessly with, you know, any, any technology partner with APIs, but it's always even better when you can enable that kind of one click integration for the customer right in the product. So I think a lot of upcoming integrations that will be really, really valuable for our customers as well. And that's great. Um, I have one more question. Uh, I'm not necessarily a baseball fan, but it's kind of baseball season. So I'll use that analogy. So if we were to use like innings and all of that, like what inning are we in this like personalization? I mean, maybe you may say, well, for some, they're like way down there and kind of the crawl, walk, run. But it seems like with what you mentioned, in what's in the horizon with AI and a lot of other really cool things that it's we're just kind of getting going. Is that? Yeah. If I had to put it in innings, I would say maybe the third, third or fourth, depending on the brand. There are some halfway through, but I think there is so much potential and things that there are technologies that don't even exist yet that are going to make personalization even more effective. So I think definitely just getting started as you mentioned but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot that can be done today with what we already have yeah i am mean, and it seems we're, we're clearly past the like science project exercise of this like can it be done it's not yeah it's like we know it can be now it's like how well and just how how personalized can it really get yeah exactly and not and it's and i also think it's not even you know how do we do it it's how do we build a methodology and a roadmap to do it. We know how, but you know, it takes time and team and effort and process and program to, and as you saw in the examples, there's just so much you can do. So it's about how do you enable your organization to do it effectively and at scale. I mean, okay. One more question. <laughs> um, if I'm starting out, obviously it's it, a lot of variables, but three month project, would you say like, you know, this is going to be a multi-year, multi-quarter or? To just implement a personalization yeah. technology. Yeah. I mean, so it doesn't take long to implement a personalization technology. You really just have to get that personalization programs um, script on your website, or if you're doing with APIs, you know, set, set up all of those connectors that you need, but that doesn't have to take very long. I would say in terms of actually getting up and running, there's a couple key things. So the first is setting up audiences. So 
I know we're pretty close to time, so I'll just touch on this really briefly, but we believe in a macro segmentation approach to build scale. So what that means is that um, people build a lot of micro segments and those can be valuable at times, but if you're just getting started, you might be building micro segments that only represent 0.3% of your traffic. So what you can do is we have different segmentation principles. Intent is one really common one, high, medium, low intent, and start A-B testing for people that fall into those three groups um, and see what resonates and then start personalizing off of those learnings. So you can create some primary audiences as we call them, define those in your product, and then define some areas that, you, that are kind of evergreen that you want to test or personalize start testing on those and then analyze those learnings and then implement some changes based off of the test results. Yeah. Again, for those that smaller group of audiences and that set number of zones on the site. So that would be like a really quick start guide way to, to have some quick wins that might actually drive some pretty significant impact. And obviously from now you can kind of see what which way the needles are moving and then kind of how you want to like turn things up. Optimize from yeah. there. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much um, for your time today. Like I mentioned to you know, draw all you up there, we have all of this captured not only through what you just heard here, but also in our, our notes here. So feel free to take advantage of that. You can get uh, endless contact info from that as well. Mine, of course. And uh, yeah, Emma, thank you so much. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. And for all of you out there, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Be sure to check out the show notes for relevant links and content. To learn even more about the power of going composable, head to contentstack.com.